My name is Max Moore. I am the president of the Alcor Life Extension Foundation, the world's largest cryonics organization. Uh, we've been in existence for 40 years, and I've personally been a member for about 26 years. I've had my arrangements for cryopreservation. It's been a very long time since we've had a conference. Uh, it's been five years since the last conference. And because this is our 40th birthday, I thought we have to have one this year. And that's what I'm here to talk about. Excellent. So um, you mentioned Alcor. How long has Alcor been around for itself? Alcor was founded back in 1972. So that's quite a long time. I think we've shown some fairly good longevity there. Uh, we really plan for the long term these days. We have a lot of procedures in place to protect our finances, to protect our patients, to make sure that we don't uh, make any fatal mistakes. A lot of the early cryonics organizations obviously were very experimental and uh, didn't really know what they were doing very well. And most of those have gone away and some of their patients have been absorbed by existing organizations. So there's really just the two of us left in the United States, really. Sure. So, um, does Alcor stand for anything? Is it an acronym? Alcor sounds like it stands for something, and I think some people have suggested possible acronyms for it, but uh, my understanding of the origin of the name is it was originally chosen by Fred and Linda Chamberlain, the founders, because it has been, well, Alcor is the name of a star in the Big Dipper. I think it's in the, in the handle of the Big Dipper. There's a star called Mizar, and it has a companion star called Alcor. And you can see Mizar pretty well, but Alcor, if you can see Alcor, you've got very sharp vision, you're very far-sighted. So it was kind of a perfect uh, metaphor. If you can see Alcor, you've got great vision of the future. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, the conference. So what are the dates and the location and venue of the conference? Well, let's talk about the conference. Okay, the conference um, is in mid-October. It's actually uh, October I think, 20th. Um, 20th and 21st, actually starting on the Friday night, and it's here in Scottsdale, Arizona, quite near Alcor's facility, and in fact on Sunday afternoon we'll be doing tours of Alcor, uh, as well as doing a cookout outside. It'll be at the Scottsdale Plaza Resort, and uh, we're probably hoping for somewhere between 150 and 200 people. Okay, so you're getting tours of Alcor, and um, yeah, that'll be interesting. So. so it, there, there seems to be a theme for 40 years in the future. Have you got any um, predictions you'd like to make about where, where Alcor should be heading within the next 40 years? Maybe even stage it in the next 10, 20, 30, and 40. Uh, I always hate to make predictions, unlike many incautious futurists and singularity types that so mm. love to give dates for things. I think the future is so unpredictable. All I can say is that uh, I know what direction we should be heading in. Mm. Uh, I think we need to reach, in the next 40 years, we need to reach that tipping point where instead of cryonics being this very hard sell where you have to introduce the whole conceptual framework and discuss it at great length before someone even has the slightest chance of beginning to think about doing it for themselves, I like to see us actually reach a turning point where uh, people see the evidence out there, they understand the basis for it, uh, it becomes something much more widely accepted in, in the scientific mainstream, and is moving closer and closer towards conventional medicine. You know, right now, they're pretty far apart, but we've been increasingly moving towards uh, a medical model. Uh, medicine has been increasingly using um, cooling techniques in surgery, uh, especially in organ preservation. So I'm hoping the two will get closer and closer together, and at some point, it will no longer seem like an odd thing. It will seem like a natural extension of existing medicine. And more and more people will be signing up, and there will be a point at which you will no longer really feel pressured to explain to your friends and relatives why you're doing this odd thing. Instead, people will be asking those who are not signed up, well, what's wrong with you? Why haven't you made a range for cryopreservation? Do you really want to die? After all, if you had a major, major cardiac problem, you'd get surgery, wouldn't you? So eventually, we're going to have that flip over, but uh, when that will happen, I don't know. I'm hoping it will be in the next 40 years, and we'll be working hard to make that happen. It's interesting. Um, people used to believe that, you know, the pain of being under the knife and sores and, and uh, getting sort of um, torn apart by all sorts of um, old medical equipment was part and parcel of being healthy and survival and part and parcel of medicine. And I think when Anise or... Um, yeah, so when something related to getting anaesthetized was suggested, it was ridiculed a little bit, and, and people thought, no, um, this is, you know, being under the knife and the pain associated with that is just part and parcel of survival um, if you're going to have surgery. Yeah, so it's interesting that uh, some of the, uh, the, the cryonics 
some of the issues related to chronics have been adopted by uh, science, like pres preservation of organs, and it's moving from speculative fiction into actual the medical model, which is nice to know. So you're giving a talk, uh, Max. Uh, what is your talk about? Well, I may be giving two talks, actually. I'm being Good. pressured now to actually give a talk on cryonics because uh, looking at what we have done, there, there isn't really a talk for people who aren't already familiar with the idea. And my assumption is that most people coming will either be members or people already very interested. But uh, there probably will be some people who come along uh, who don't know that much about it. So maybe I'll be giving an extra talk on exactly what is cryonics as we do it the alcohol way. What's the, you know, the basic procedures? What's the rationale behind it? Uh, but my main talk is really how to be an exemplary cryonicist. Uh, some people have had this sort of assumption that, well, all I have to do is make my arrangements with Alcor, do the paperwork, put my funding in place, and then that's it. I can just forget about it, and if I have a problem, they'll swoop in and, and save me, and that's all fine. But, of course, the real world doesn't work that way. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do to improve your chances of getting cryopreserved under good circumstances. If you die, for instance, in a, uh, far away from us with no warning, um, with nobody around you, um, you may not be discovered for several days. That's extremely bad news. So you know you can make sure that people around you are supportive. Um, you can, if you know you're at risk, you can get medical monitoring devices that will you know set off a phone call if you need it. Um, if you know you're terminal and have cancer, you can move from wherever you are to here in Scottsdale and, and check into a hospice so you're right nearby. That means we can minimize our response time. In fact, I think our best response time. Um, from the point of declaration of legal clinical death to arrival of the patient at Alcor, um, including administration of all medications and initial cooling, is about 32 minutes or so. So that's a very short time frame. Um, so those kinds of actions, also certain you know, health measures you can take, uh, especially to reduce your risk of sudden death, uh, cardiac problems in particular, uh, those are all steps you can take, and there are quite a few others including uh, you know, protecting your finances, making sure that you keep up with inflation over the years. So I'll essentially be outlining you know, to be a good cryonicist, not one who just uh, makes the arrangements and forgets about them, what can you do? Excellent. Well, so what excites you about cryonics? And what are you optimistic about? And what's, what is there to look forward to in the future? Well, I think we've made huge progress in cryonics over the decades. Um, we now have a certain amount of empirical evidence that what we're doing works, at least under good conditions. And of course, conditions vary hugely uh, for some of the same reasons I was just talking about. If we don't get uh, advanced notice, if we don't know for hours or days afterwards uh, that a person is clinically dead, then you know, there's not a whole lot we can do. Um, but if we get to somebody quickly, our current procedures, the current cryoprotection, the cryoprotection protocols, um, given the studies we've done with electron microscope studies, uh, CT scans that we've been doing recently of brains show us how well we've done the perfusion. It looks pretty much that if we get to you under good circumstances and don't have any, any unusual problem, then I think there's a high probability that we are successfully preserving your personality. Now, of course, it's still up to the future to have that technology to reverse the cryoprotection process, but uh, I think under good conditions, you have a very good chance of actually making it at this point. Excellent. So, it seems like That's there it. is a lot of. Sorry. sorry. Oh, let me just add to that that uh, one of the one of the speakers at the conference I invited is kind of precisely on this point. Um, how do you know how well you're doing? How do you know Cranix is working at all? So um, we invited Sebastian Xiang, professor of MIT, to give a talk because he has a book out on the connectome and towards the end of the book discusses cryonics and essentially challenges cryonics. Can you show that you are preserving the connectome? Connectome being his you know, popular new term for all the, all the connections in the brain, essentially what makes you up. And uh, we think we actually already have quite a bit of evidence that he may not be quite aware of. Um, and we're very open to more studies and more evidence to you know, do more, bio well, sorry, more biopsies, uh, doing more samples. And uh, we'd actually, just a few days ago, had offered a $10,000 contribution to the Brain Preservation Foundation Technology Prize, which has been set up essentially to evaluate brain preservation processes, both chemopreservation and cryopreservation. Now, unfortunately, we just learned a couple of days ago that they decided not to accept our contribution, I think because they thought that there might be a perception of bias, uh, even though there is no direct Alcor team competing for the prize. Uh, but still, we're very interested in objective evidence, empirical evidence that we can show the public and show scientists in particular that, look, 
Given what we know about memory and personality and where that's stored in the brain, our procedures under decent conditions are doing the job of preserving that. And that shifts the whole burden of argument onto their shoulders then. Yeah, well, that's that's actually a really good point because a lot of this discussion um, in the public square on this this topic um, doesn't seem to be focused on the evidence. It doesn't seem to be focused on the sort of questions to tease out, um, you know, whether cryonics will work and how to improve uh, the chances of cryonics working or how to prove the chances of any sort of preservation working. Um, so what are the sorts of discussions that are dominating public, the public square at the moment that need to change, do you think? Well, it's true what you're saying is you don't usually even get to the point of discussing the technical aspects of how well you're preserving the brain. Um, usually people dismiss cryonics before you get anywhere close to that. Uh, we see the same objections and to me usually rationalizations over and over again. I mean, very common one is that uh, if we lived a lot longer uh, cryonics being, of course, a bridge to living longer because when, when we come back, the idea would be not to come back in your old body, but in a, a rejuvenated body at a time when we've actually conquered the aging process. Um, so people always saying, well, life would be meaningless without having you know, a certain death, even though, of course, you could choose to end your existence when you like, and you're not going to be immortal. You still could have accidents and homicides and suicides and so on. Um, but to me, that's an, just an absurd argument. Um, people now live a lot longer than they did in centuries past. And we don't necessarily think our life is less meaningful. I think it depends on what you do with it. And there's no particular reason why it should suddenly become meaningless um, because you might live for centuries or even millennia. Uh, to me, I would say, well, why don't they just do the experiment and find out? If they find out after 100 or 200 years that they're not enjoying their life, that it's meaningful and boring, well, they can check out again. There's nothing to stop them. Um, but if they don't make this choice, then you know, they won't have that option. I can't really, I can't really fathom that as being a reasonable objection. I think it's kind of a lazy rationalization of people who really don't want to deal with the idea that maybe current death, as we currently understand it, is not necessarily inevitable. People feel very uncomfortable with the idea of death, and they either want to think that they're definitely going somewhere else to some better place when they die, or they want to just better not think about it at all. It's just going to be the end, and that's fine. When we come along and say, well, look, we've got this procedure which is not really proven. There's evidence for it, but it's not proven. It may or may not work, um, and it some, you know, costs some money to do, and there's some difficulty in making the arrangements. They don't want to deal with that. It's in that discomfort zone, especially because their, their family's probably not doing it, their friends are not doing it. It's not mainstream. It's not the standard expected thing. So we have to break, break through all those barriers before we even get to a you know, discussion about how well are we actually preserving your brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I think there's so much to look forward to in the future. Um, it could be an amazing uh, time to be alive. I mean, I think now is, is quite incredible. Uh, it's a great time to be alive. Um, with all the sort of nascent technology uh, that are sort of in embryonic form or incubating and, and you know, slowly coming into an existence, it would be very interesting to see what's possible in the next 100, 200, 1,000 years, you know, spacefaring and all that. I, I think that that's just amazing. A lot of what we dream about in, in um, our speculative fiction could be really amazing. It's definitely something to look forward to. Um, yeah, it's a chance to live that future, to see it for ourselves rather than just to speculate about it. Give us a chance to, to be part of it and to create that future too. Definitely. Yeah, I generally think that um, the future, in my view, is very much that you know, there are bumps along the way, but in, in the long run, things do get better. Life gets better over, over time. Uh, if you ask me, would you rather, would you swap your life now with one sometime in the past? No, I cannot think of any time in the past when I would rather have lived. Um, even simple things, just going back a century or so, uh, you, know, mentioned, you mentioned anesthesia earlier. Imagine a life with no anesthesia. If you get toothache, there's nothing you can do about it. Earache, nothing you can do about it. Um, you know, you're severely injured, uh, really, there's nothing. You're just helpless. Uh, we're going to die at some early age of a horrible infection. So, and that was just a hundred years or so ago. Um, so I think generally things get better. We get healthier. We live longer. Um, of course, new challenges arise, and I'm not expecting a perfect utopian future. There will be new, new difficulties and challenges, but I think there'll be more interesting ones as we deal with some of the standard problems of human beings. And I'd certainly like to be there and give it a chance. Um, I made my, my big jump from England to California back in the 80s, and that was a pretty alien environment. I didn't really know anybody, but I somehow survived. 
So I'm not too worried, especially because I have so many of my friends and colleagues who are making that trip with me, if it works, that uh, I won't be, won't be doing it solo. Definitely. Sounds like a, a great conference to go to. Um, so so if, if people want to make donations, or is there any sponsor, sponsorship opportunities for the conference and for Alcor in general, I guess? Yes, if you go, just go to the, actually the main Alcor webpage, just alcor.org, and you'll see the conference there right on front. And uh, follow through that to the conference page. There is a section for sponsors, and we're looking for sponsors to help us defray the cost of speaker uh, travel expenses and so on. So there are a number of sponsorship opportunities. Um, people can be anonymous; they can have their name put on the program for sponsoring particular parts of the conference. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think one big well, thing. I, yeah. One big thing I'd like to just mention about the conference, apart from uh, you know, looking at the evidence for cryonic right now, there's going to be a series of talks which I think will be especially fascinating. On uh, not on cryonics per se, but on life extension, because obviously, for cryonics to be worth doing, we don't want to come back you know, just for a very short period of time and die again of some other condition. We want to come back when aging has been conquered. So, what about aging? What progress are we making? What is the right approach? Well, I've lined up three excellent speakers, each of whom has a quite different perspective on things. Um, so, you know, we have uh, Aubrey de Grey, who's been obviously very well known and speaks all over the place. Uh, Joshua Mitteldorf, who has a view about programmed aging, and then uh, Michael Rose, who also has a very quite different perspective. So we'll have a series of three talks with different perspectives, then we're going to put these three smart people together and have them argue it out and uh, you know, discuss the, how, do we, how do we make progress. Uh, is there a paradigm that's blocking that progress? So I think that'll be a very stimulating discussion. Yeah, um, Aubrey de Grey came and spoke at the last Humanity Plus Summer in Melbourne, which was fantastic. I got to do a long interview with him and split it up into parts, categorised. And it was very interesting. He's a very smart person. Um, I think him and Michael Rose might have an interesting discussion. Michael Rose is the guy who uh, um, bred flies. Is that correct? Yeah, he's That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think he's a proponent of the antagonistic pleiotropy. Um, idea, if I'm not wrong. I, I think, yeah, Aub Aubrey and him should debate about that. <laughs> they have debated before, actually. They, they debated at uh, the Humanity Plus conference in Caltech about, I guess that's two years ago now, and Michael loves to uh, have a little go at Aubrey. He gets kind of feisty, and uh, so they had a very, uh, it, it wasn't an angry disagreement, but it was it was kind of a pointed discussion. Yeah. So uh, I think they reached some level of, of greater agreement on that. So it'll be interesting to see what their, their current perspectives are. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, is there any um, conclusive statements you'd like to make for the interview about uh, um, the conference, the alcohol conference? Yes, come to the conference. Yay. It's going to be, uh, the, there won't be another one next year. I'm, I guarantee you we're not doing this every year. Uh, it'll probably be two or three years between conferences. You don't have to be, um, that interested in cryonics as such to come. If you're interested in life extension, if you're interested in uh, some of the ideas behind cryonics, it's going to be a lot of really fascinating people here. So I think it's very worthwhile. Uh, certainly for anybody of a transhumanist interest, um, you know, this is a very practical thing you can do. We can talk about breaking past human limits, but uh, right now we haven't really extended the human aging, uh, the, the human lifespan enormously. So cryopreservation is a very important backup option. Uh, so. <clears throat> With anybody interested in cryonics or life extension, uh, any of these surrounding issues, this is the event to come to, and we're the only one like this for a few years. Excellent. So, just a so reminder on the web address that people should go to, um, and the dates. Yeah. So the web address is just alcor.org, A-L-C-O-R.org, and the conference is on the weekend of October twentieth to twenty-first. Excellent. Right. And we even have right. the mayor of Scottsdale opening the conference for us. So wow. it's wow. very mainstream. Oh, that's good. Hopefully, there will um, be quite a bit of press interest um, coming to the conference. That'd be good. I mean, just to get the idea out there into the mainstream a little bit more. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. All right. looking forward to it. Cheerio. Cheerio. Thank you very much Thank you. for your time. Thank you. Rob. And we'll speak soon. Okay. Bye bye.